This year, make Christ Church your destination for a meaningful Christmas. Live music is just the beginning. Experience joyous events and festive family fun that will light up your heart. <laughs> Wednesday, December 6th, follow the reindeer to the Christmas celebration with Santa. Enjoy crafts, games, the Christmas story, special music, and photos with Santa. Bring your kids, bring your cameras, and let Christ Church take care of the rest. Sunday, December 10th at 4 p.m., the Christ Church Choir will present the Christmas musical offering, Love Made a Way. Join the choir, children's choir, and orchestra members from the community with the singing of hymns, carols, and songs of worship. Come and celebrate how love made a way for each of us from a manger to a cross. For a jingle jangle jolly old time, it's the Metropolitan Bells. This talented group rings their way through both sacred and secular Christmas favorites. Truly elite entertainment that amazes and amuses. Tuesday, December 19th, the Metropolitan Bells. Experience the wonder of Christmas Eve candlelight at Christ Church. In the sanctuary, celebrate Christmas traditions with special music from the sanctuary choir, soloist, and instrumentalist. The family event in the Commons plays host to a lively interactive service for all ages. Whichever you choose, you are invited to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ with carols, candlelighting, and a message of hope. Services begin at 3 and 5 in each area and promise to be unique and memorable. There is a reason for the season and so many ways for you and your family to find it. Experience Christmas at Christ Church. Welcome to worship today. It's so good to see you here. I'm David Hall, one of the pastors here at Christ Church. As you can see, we've got lots of events and worship services coming during this season of Advent and Christmas. <clears throat> This Wednesday evening, we have our beautiful Christmas program that's going to include uh, Santa Claus. We'll have our last meal of the season in Community Cafe. We serve from 5 till 6.15, and then at 6 o'clock from 6 until 7.30 in the gym. We're going to have all kinds of games and crafts and activities for the whole family, so come and join us there. And then up the connector hallway, Santa Claus is going to be there, so bring your camera or phone and and uh, save some memories from that. Come, it's going to be a wonderful evening this Wednesday. Come and join us and invite someone to come with you if you would. Next Sunday afternoon at 4, as you saw in the video, we have an awesome musical that will be presented by our sanctuary choir, by our children's choir, or in orchestra members. That's 4 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It's called Love Made Away. Another one of those beautiful services for this season as we celebrate the birth of Christ. As you complete your plans for Christmas Eve, remember now Christmas Eve this year is falling on Sunday, and so we're going to have one worship service on Christmas Eve morning at 10 o'clock. It'll be here in the sanctuary. Come to that and then pick your choice for the afternoon and evening. We have uh, two candlelight services at 3 and 2 at 5. Uh, the ones here in the sanctuary are going to have beautiful music that'll be more of the blended traditional style down in the commons, also a beautiful Christmas music, but it's going to be more interactive, and in fact, children can be part of the nativity scene, the live nativity. So pick the time and the style that you prefer and come and join us for one of those candlelight services. Now we hope you'll register your attendance. If you're sitting closest to the aisle, there's a blue attendance pad in the back of the seat in front of you. If you would take that out, write in the name of each person in your party, pass that along your row and back. You can use the Christ Church app to register also, and for those of you worshiping with us at home, please do register your attendance on the app. Thank you.
Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and we have our children reading the Advent readings this year. We begin in the Advent season today by lighting the candle of hope. One of the Bible writers describes God as the God of hope. God gives us this powerful gift that can help us face any struggle in life. The prophet Isaiah says, but those who trust in the Lord will receive new strengths they will fly as high as eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not grow weak. You are invited to receive and share God's gift of hope. Now let's stand together as we sing, I want to walk as a child of the light and I want to follow Jesus, amen? Let's sing together. Good morning, my name is Debbie Stokes. It's my joy to serve as one of your pastors here. And our scripture today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16, the first verse, and then verses 6 through 12. Hear now the words from Holy Scripture. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. 
I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesus called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before him. And, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are all these your sons that you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come for to die. 
Yes, let all the people say amen. As we continue in the spirit of worship, this week we are celebrating that in your giving, you make it possible for the garden that we have that is able to give so much food to so many in our community, pounds and pounds and pounds of food from the, from the garden here that you are a part of by your gifts and talents into the garden. And you've also made it possible, the garden needed a new fence around it. So our fix-it ministry made that possible too. And you helped make the supplies possible by your tithes and offerings. So thank you for sharing in that ministry and the many ministries of our church. You may give in a variety of ways. You may give as you exit from the sanctuary. You may give online or through the church out by dropping it off at the church office or mailing it in. Let us bow together in prayer. Loving, gracious, giving, creating, providing God, thank you so much for the gift of life today. And as we enter into this season of Advent, awaiting your birth into our lives afresh and anew. May, be, may every part of who we are be tuned in to your spirit. With our eyes, may we have your vision. With our ears, may we hear you tuning our hearts to you by the smells of this season of the cinnamon and the spices. May we remember to adore you and to bring you the gifts of our heart. And may you touch our lives in new ways. You are with us every step of the way. You're here in this room. You'll be present with the individuals or families who are listening online. And with the sixth sense that you've given us, help us to feel your presence in our hearts. And know that you are with us every step of life's journey. You call us into service for others. So may we always find our feet following you. We lift up to you this day those who are going through a difficult season of life, who may be in the hospital or ICU rooms, who may be going through treatments, that they may experience your presence and your peace in a powerful way too for as you bring healing into their lives. We pray for those who are going through a season of sorrow and grief, that they will feel a double outpouring of your comfort and peace in this time. We thank you for the gift of being in your presence and praying. We pray now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I often like to say on the first Sunday of Advent, Happy New Year. <laughs> on the Christian calendar, this is when the year 
of telling the story of Jesus begins. And we start the story by preparing for his birth by the season of Advent. A couple months ago, I was praying and discerning, uh, uh, seeking God's direction on what I should focus on during this season. And I was given the focus of Bethlehem. I began to think through, study through the scriptures and several people and circumstances associated with that place. And so I developed the sermons, but I was struggling with what the whole series would be titled, what title to give to it. I was at home one evening and still wrestling with that, and I walked into the kitchen where my wife Vicki and our son Matt was, were talking, and I told them what I was into and what I was looking for, trying to figure out. And I said, so what, what is that word or those phrases that we use when we want to attract tourists to a particular place? And almost immediately, my son said, how about Destination Bethlehem? I said, that's it. You got it. Well, he got this kind of smug smile on his face and turned to walk out of the room and said, my work is done here. As the gospel according to Luke tells the Christmas story, the writer mentions that Bethlehem is the city of David, the town of David. Our scripture passage today tells the story of when we first find that out. However, before we go there, let's go back a little bit earlier in the Bible story to hear more about this town. First of all, let me mention that the word Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem means house of bread in the Hebrew language. Or at least that's the only meaning I had heard over the years. But as I did a little bit more reading and research this week, I found out that the end of that name can also mean to fight or to battle. And I, I wondered about that for a little while. And I thought, you know, that really does fit with David, who went on to become a warrior. It, and in a very real sense, it also fits with Jesus. Because he came to fight in a very different way against the forces of evil. So Bethlehem can mean house of battle as well as house of bread. And as you think about that, both of those meanings are very appropriate, very fitting to the life and ministry of Jesus. The first mention of Bethlehem in the Bible is Genesis 35 verse 19 where we're told it was the place where Rachel was buried. Rachel was one of the two wives of Jacob, who had 12 sons and later got his name changed to Israel. Those 12 sons are those original, those initial children of Israel. Rachel died while giving birth to Benjamin, the last of those 12 sons. Rachel's buried in Bethlehem, and that's the first time in the Bible we hear about this place. Now, a quick note, side note there, out of the Christmas story. You may recall, some of you may recall, in Matthew's gospel, after Herod has all the children killed there in Bethlehem, the writer tells us that Rachel was, quote, weeping for her children. And you may have wondered before, what's, what's that all about? Who's Rachel and what's that all about? Well, that's, this is where that reference comes from. Rachel's buried in Bethlehem. And, and so that's, there's the reference of even then she's weeping for her children. The next most prominent time we hear about Bethlehem is in the book of Ruth. I invite you, let's take a moment and visit that story. Her story begins by telling about her in-laws. Um, here's the first verse of that book. In the days when the judges ruled. Now, the judges, when the, the days when the judges ruled, that would have been the time after the children of Israel have arrived in the land but they're not yet united. They're a loose confederation of tribes. And when they would face a crisis, a leader would emerge uh, among them to help them through that crisis. Those were known as judges. Those leaders were known as judges. Not like we think about judges in a courtroom, but these leaders were known as judges. So that whole seventh book of the Bible that's called Judges tells about that time. And the next book is the story of Ruth. It begins, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, 
went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Well, one of those sons married a woman named Ruth. But within a few years, the father and the two sons died. So the wife of that man, her name was Naomi. Naomi decided to go back to her hometown of Bethlehem. And even though Naomi tried to discourage her daughter-in-law, Ruth decided to go with her. That's where we get these beautiful lines. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. So she goes with her mother-in-law to live in Bethlehem. Ruth ends up remarrying into Naomi's husband's family. Ruth's husband's name was Boaz, and he and Ruth had a son named Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. And as we heard in our story from today, Jesse was the father of David. So Ruth, this foreign woman, was the grandmother of David, maybe the greatest king of Israel. It's interesting to note in the opening chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew that when he gives the lineage of Jesus, he includes Ruth in that list. This foreign woman is on that list. So when first century people heard the Christmas story from Matthew and Luke's Gospel, and they heard the town of Bethlehem mentioned, they would have known this history about this place. They would have definitely known the story we heard read earlier from 1 Samuel. So let's look at it a little bit further. Saul was the first king of Israel. But he was not fully obedient to God, so God rejected him as king and had chosen who would be the next king. Samuel was God's prophet and a leader among the people at that time. Samuel did a lot of teaching and guiding of the people. But God still had a major lesson he wanted to teach even Samuel. That lesson for Samuel and for all of us is what I'm calling God's first gift at Bethlehem. Later we'll celebrate God's greatest gift that came out of Bethlehem. But for now, let's look at this first gift. God told the prophet to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, to find this new king. When Samuel saw Jesse's oldest son, he thought, that's got to be it. He's the one. The NIV, the New International Version of the Scriptures, translates God's response like this. Do not consider his appearance or his height. Can I just quickly say that I'm kind of offended that, that God's not impressed with a person's height? I, I mean, that gets me in, in good favor in certain settings, but... Apparently, God's not impressed. After all, I didn't really do anything to get tall. I just got tall. My mother threatened to put a brick on my head during my teenage years. Um, We're told that King Saul was tall, and apparently Jesse's oldest son was tall. But in God's eyes, how tall you are is not a factor in how God sees you. Here's how Eugene Peterson offers this verse in his message translation. But God told Samuel, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. God judges persons differently than humans do. God looks into the heart. God looks on the inside of a person, no matter their appearance. And when you think about it, Uh, We all learn from life experience that people can be real good at putting on appearances. We can dress up our physical appearance. Um, we, We can also be good at putting on a front for people around us. People ask us, how are you doing? And we say, fine, when we know deep inside that we're struggling, we're wrestling, we're not fine. But we know how to smile and act as if everything's all right. There's a lot about this thing of appearances that can apply here. We can act like we like or even love somebody, when in reality, we really don't like them at all. So in more than one way, we can all find ourselves judging another person 
by what we experience of them on the outside or what appears on the outside. There are people who are really good at putting on appearances that try to cover what's really going on inside or who simply want to hide or feel like they have to hide what's going on inside. God gives Samuel and all of us this gift, this life lesson here in Bethlehem, the city of David. You don't really know a person until you know who they are on the inside. That's where you find out about their integrity, their character, their values, their ability to love and forgive, and so much more about their spirit, who they are as a person. And you know, a person can have all that, no matter how tall they are, or what color hair they have, or whether they have hair at all. Let's, let's call this life lesson, this gift, insight. Now, I know that word insight means, usually means having some understanding about something, sometimes a sudden understanding about something. But let's, for today, just for this lesson, for this gift, let's put a hyphen in that word and let it be the name of this gift that God gives us, this life lesson that God gives us in Bethlehem. Don't let somebody's appearance prevent you from getting to know who they are, who they really are on the inside. Don't, that, that includes letting any labels they may have been given by somebody else. Don't let that stop you from trying to understand who they really are on the inside. Well, as I thought about that gift, I got to thinking about other gifts, especially as I read through the Bible story, uh, gifts that we get even before we get to Bethlehem, even before we get this lesson from Bethlehem, gifts that God gives every person no matter who you are. How about we start with the gift of life itself? God is our creator. God is the one who gave you life, the gift of life. You didn't do anything to earn it. You just showed up one day. You're given life. Yes, I know there's been times when life has been hard. You may be going through a difficult time in your life right now. But there have also been times when life is good, and those times will return. Just getting to be alive in God's world is amazing. Getting to participate in this marvelous drama called life is wonderful. And it's given as a gift. And then there's nature, the world, the universe, all of creation. God created the birds and the fish and the butterflies, the cats and the dogs, the trees and the flowers and the bushes, the sun and moon and stars, the lakes and rivers and oceans, the mountains and the valleys. And it's all free to enjoy. It's God's gift to you and me and everybody else. Even if you can't afford to go to the zoo or to the aquarium, you can just walk through the woods or out by the river and enjoy some marvelous gifts that God has given all of us, freely given. You get the gifts of rain and sunshine, sunrises and sunsets. And let's not forget the height of God's creation, the humans. Yes, I know they, we, uh, can all be like that gift you want to return in exchange for something else sometimes. I get that. But in the big picture and in the long range of life, we all like having other people along for the ride. As I continued thinking about the early biblical story, I thought about the gift of covenant. And here's where I'm going with that. It is, it is God's initiative to be in relationship with us, even though we broke relationship with God. Even though the world turned against God, God called out Abraham to establish a covenant people through whom God could bless all the people of the earth. God wants to be our God. God wants to guide us into the best that life has to offer. And part of this gift are boundaries, laws and commandments that protect us from the ways of life that can go wrong and can bring much harm. 
and then ultimately through Jesus Christ. God emphasizes that this gift of covenant relationship is offered to everybody, everybody, including you. And connected to that, I certainly have to include on this list of gifts that God gives the gift of grace. God's offer of forgiveness and restoration to you and me and everybody else. The Bible reminds us that we don't deserve this gift, but God freely gives us. God uh, offers the gift of his son, and Jesus freely gives his very life so that we might have eternal life that begins now and lasts forever. And I would suggest that this is the main gift on this list, that God invites us not only to receive and know for ourselves, but to share with others, to share God's good news, Jesus' gospel, good news, that God loves them too. God forgives them too. And then I would add to this list of gifts from God the whole library of books we call the Bible. In particular, I lift up the Psalms because it's the book that teaches us to pray and what a gift prayer is, God's invitation into an ongoing relationship, an ongoing conversation. We can share with God anything that's going on in our life, any experiences that you have from day to day, whether they feel like you're on a mountaintop or in a valley or somewhere in between, you can talk to God about that. You can can, um, Converse with God about that. You can celebrate or you can cry. You can shout for joy or shout your frustrations. You can confess and complain and sing. Talk to this Holy Spirit who is God through the gift of prayer. And finally, I place on this list the gift of God's presence. God desires to be with us to be involved in our life and in all the world. You see it early in the, Christ, in the creation story when God comes walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. You hear it in God's call to Moses to go to Pharaoh when he says, I've heard the cry of my people and I've come down to rescue them. And of course, we'll hear it most fully once again in God's desire in that um, one of the names given to the Christ child here at Christmas, Emmanuel. It means God is with us. The town where the Christmas story is focused is a little place called Bethlehem. It's got a rich history. Uh, It is there that God gave God's greatest gift to all the world. But even before the events of Christmas happened, the place has that history that many people, when they first heard about it, the story, they would know that history. Long before the birth of Jesus, God gifted Israel with a new king from Bethlehem and a life lesson, a gift to a prophet and to all of us about how God sees people and how God invites us to learn to see people. And as we think about that gift, we're reminded of many other gifts that God gives so freely to everybody. I invite you to join us over the next few weeks as we continue to journey to Bethlehem. Let's pray. Gracious God, as always, we give you thanks for this reminder of your mission from the beginning and of gifts that you so freely give to all of us. You've given us the gift of life and the gift of new life through Christ. We thank you for this first gift from Bethlehem, a a life lesson about how to see people and how to judge who people are, not by outward appearances, but by what's on the inside. Remind us to get past those fronts and those appearances to truly get to know somebody and to share your good news with them. Continue to teach us to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen.
and still need help somehow. I'm not a child, but my heart still can dream. So here's my lifelong wish, my grown-up Christmas list. Not for myself, but for a world in need. No more lives torn apart that wars would never start and time would heal all hearts. As children, we believed that the grandest sight to see was something lovely wrapped beneath our tree. Well, heaven surely knows that packages and bows can never start and time would heal all hearts everyone would have a friend and right would always win and love would never end oh this is my grown up christmas name What is this illusion called? The innocence of youth. Maybe only in our blind belief can we ever find the truth. This is my only lifelong wish. This is my grown up Christmas. As I hear that song, I think about a couple of lines we prayed in a prayer earlier in the service. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's another way to say that very thing. Thank you. As always, we invite you to begin or to deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that's what to be a part of this kingdom is all about. And know that you're welcome here at Christ Church. We believe it happens best in the life of the church as we journey together. There's contact information for Pastor David. I know he would love to hear from you. Any of us would. And even as we close the service, you're welcome to come uh, or anytime. We want to uh, journey with you. Uh, 
toward Bethlehem and beyond. We close our service with one of those traditional, maybe uh, one of the most traditional hymns of Advent. Let's stand and join in singing. So we go seeking to be the people of this Christ, this child of Bethlehem, who grows to teach us so much about the kingdom and how God sees people. We got that gift in an earlier visit to Bethlehem. Go live that gift. Go be that people. Amen? God bless you as you go. Have a great week. Hope to see you next week with one or even a carload.